In order to become the best, it needs to become a, a daily habit. It needs to become something that you don't even think about, just like brushing your teeth. I've changed every aspect of their life from detoxification, what they brush their teeth with. What Wait, what they brush their teeth with? Yeah, what they brush their teeth with, yeah. Very important. Ruben Tavares, one of the world's top coaches and nutritionists. Who are some of the athletes that you've worked with? David Hay, Amir Khan, George Groves, Dillian White, Derek Chisora, Joe Joyce, Dina Asher Smith. Footballers such as John Terry, Callum hudson Ladoy, rugby players such as Danny Cipriani, cricketers, etc. etc. Mm, I've worked with wow. all different types of sports. Yeah. Discipline has been one of the biggest factors in both him, his mum and myself have taught him a lot of discipline. I remember when he was maybe eight, nine, he kept forgetting his water. And then I said to him one day, I said, that's enough, we'll never get your water again. Ruben. Why is this conversation going to be helpful for parents who want their children to become the best footballers that they can be? Um, okay, without, um, how can I say this? Without sounding like I'm blowing myself up or yeah. you know, fanning my own flame. Um, I, I feel like I, for the last 20 plus years, I've been training some of the best athletes on the planet, not just the ones that were at the top, but the ones that w no one knew of and came through and became the best on earth. Um, and I've been there and done it. I was a member of the Royal Ballet School. I did that for eight years, um, then went on to track and field, represented England and Great Britain, became European Junior Champion. And then through illness and injuries and just not having the right or adequate coaching, I had to find answers to my questions. Um, and at the time it felt like a curse, mm. but now I wouldn't give that up for anything because it's made me the person and the coach that I am. Mm. Um, and I'm a parent. So, um, I've, you know, literally put my, uh, my money where my mouth is and, and especially when it comes to my children and, and whenever they've asked me to help them with something, mm. I've gone away, researched. And if I didn't know or asked my extensive network of people, mm. um, and giving them the best advice possible. Plus the other thing is, I feel like I'm not with a federation, I'm not with a football club, I'm not with um, with anyone, I'm independent. So I can give the most, the best, most uh, independent advice possible. And who are some of the athletes that you've worked with? Um, David Hay, Ty uh, I was gonna say Tiny Temper, I see him, <laughs> I see him as an athlete. Um, I've also trained Tiny Temper. Um, David Hay, Amir Khan, George Groves, Dillian White, Derek Chisora, Joe Joyce, that's from boxing. Yeah. Um, Dina Asher Smith, who in 2019, I helped to become the fastest woman on earth and the first British woman to become a global sprint champion. Um, footballers such as John Terry, Callum hudson Adoy, rugby players such as um, Danny Cipriani, um, I've worked with cricketers, etc., etc. Mm, I've worked with wow. all different types of sports, yeah, yeah, and I've yeah, just immersed yeah. myself and made this my life's work and passion mm. to know as much as possible, um, and then come up with my own philosophy um, and ways of doing things that which aren't the normal. Mm. And can you describe what you've done with these different athletes? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I think that. What I have done is um, help them realize that in order to become the best, you need to, it needs to become a, a daily habit. It needs to become something that you don't even think about, just like brushing your teeth. So um, from, I've changed every aspect of their life from detoxification, I mentioned teeth, what they brush their teeth with, um, what Wait, they, what they brush their teeth with? Yeah, what they brush their teeth with, yeah. Very important. As Colgate? in... Huh? Wait, Colgate? 
Wait, non no. non fluoride toothpaste. I can't, I can't or... mention what you just mentioned because I've had an email from them. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> Back in 2012, okay, saying okay. that I shouldn't mention them. But but, but um, so so tooth is it? Even the tooth, though I didn't, someone else did. The toothbrush or the toothpaste? Tooth toothpaste. Um. So so non fluoride. Yes, non fluoride toothpaste. To uh, because fluoride, contrary what to what some dentists believe now, there are new age dentists who are starting to get through this information and they're starting to see that there there are now studies which show that fluoride lowers your testosterone levels so as an athlete that's the last thing you need toothpaste also has something called so sodium lauryl sulfate which is yeah. a neurotoxin which slows your reactions so just by brushing your teeth twice a day with this uh, these type of toothpaste that have so many chemicals in them you're actually hindering yourself as an athlete as a human being in general but especially as an athlete. So I try to make sure that everyone I work with gets every single percent um, from every aspect of their life. That, that's so, so interesting. And we're, we're going to get, we're, you know, and I'll be careful not to go into the detail too <laughs> early because I really want to like keep going with this route for the conversation. Yeah. But just on this subject, Matthew makes fun of me because <laughs> that the water bottle that I've got here today yeah. It's, it's it's water. A, it's a hydrogen ion. Yeah, but like, bottle, yeah, but, it. but like for the last five weeks, I've been drinking water that mm. hasn't got any fluoride in it. Mm -hmm. So it's this extensive exercise where I have to have the filtered water that has no fluoride in it, mm -hmm. and then pouring it into this bottle. It's it's quite excessive, but I'm looking for that personally. I'm looking for that optimization that's happened, and I, I've discovered that fluoride has real negative impacts. I didn't know about the testosterone, but I knew that it. There's studies that are showing that it affects IQ. Yeah, oh, absolutely, because it also affects creativity. Yeah. Because it calcifies the pineal gland, and the pineal gland is the center of all creativity. Right. And so... Um... The, the study <coughs> that, that, that it was talked about mm -hmm. by Gary Burke, <coughs> and Brecker. it's... A, oh, what's that again? Brecker. Brecker, sorry. <laughs> it said that they did studies that showed that the highest levels of fluoride in America across states had the lowest levels of IQ mm -hmm. and I've debated with my friends well what's the causation it might be that states that were underfunded potentially also underfund their schools and then also that affects the water quality so it might be not causation but mm -hmm. it There's... seemed like there are di direct uh, links and I, I was at Waitrose yesterday and I was trying to find toothpaste that didn't have fluoride in it and you couldn't do it. Yeah, it's you you do. There's always aloe vera toothpaste right next to, or uh, charcoal toothpaste or uh, things there? like that. Yeah, you just have to look. Um, so, so is that a gain for parents right now at the start of this episode? That is something that they should be trying to implement with their children. Absolutely. Like, I, I always say, look, you're not going to have to do what I used to do when you know back in 2008 when I was training someone like David Hay, where I couldn't find coconut water because there wasn't any in the shelves. So I had to go to Brixton, uh, speak to the Jamaican guy in the in the um, in the stall, and say, "Can I have coconut water?" And he used to chop up twenty coconuts. We used to put them in these big vats of water. Yeah. And then that's what David was drinking. It was an extensive exercise. Yeah. You know, now you can find good quality, uh, natural coconut water. You have to be careful. I'm, I'm not going to mention names, but there are certain most of the brands of coconut water out there. Are mostly not coconut water. They've been um, dehydrated, and then the, really? the material's been brought to Europe, and all then right. they add water, and then they can call it coconut water and okay. all that kind of stuff. That's not uh, what I'm talking about. I'm talking about natural coconut water. But nowadays, you have an amazing wealth of of different things which I couldn't find back then, so I had to to oh. find a way to do it. So now, if you go to any of these supermarkets, you can find the the sodium sodium chloride uh, sodium fluoride, sorry, free toothpaste, really? so SLS free, and all those kind of so things. Is there? Yeah. Okay. You just have okay. to look. You just all have right. to look. So yeah. for parents, my advice is always always go away and do some research. Yeah. I always say this. Now, I know for a fact that everything I speak of, I've done extensive research on it yeah but i would i would challenge you to go away and become your best researcher you know this is to do with your children and you want the, what's best for your children so 
don't just take my word for it go away and do some research because as soon as i found this a lot as soon as uh, someone listens to this podcast and yep. goes away and says, oh, there was actually this guy in there and he's trained all these athletes and he's got all these credentials and he was talking about that you shouldn't have fluoridated toothpaste. There might be a dentist in the family and says, that's actually incorrect uh, because I studied this at university yeah. and this and that and the other. Go away and look at the research. There's research now coming out of America which is which shows that not not only does it cause all of the things that we've spoken about but some yeah. other very horrific things um go and do your research that way you arm yourself with the best information possible but before, before i forget the water that you're drinking some of the research that i've looked at is it's hydrogenated water yeah so hydrogen ion water has a very high antioxidant level okay yeah so drinking a liter and a half of it is like having i don't know in terms of anti antioxidant activity yeah. within the cells, it's like having three, four hundred carrots. Really? Yeah, that oh kind of thing. Oh my god. So, I've only have been having it two days. I just got <laughs> bought it recently. <laughs> Hide the brand and then get in touch with them, get, uh, get an egg from them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of different brands. I was going to say, with, um, it's just more of what we talk about with the level of football player mm -hmm. becoming more, what well, I think, becoming. Um, kind of equally and out in terms of their, their ability on the ball, their athleticism, it's becoming a much more level playing field. Mm -hmm. So it is the stuff away from the pitch that starts Absolutely. to separate them. So Absolutely. massively to do with like their mindset and psychology and everything else. But then just all those little bits now yeah. are becoming the game changers, everything off the field. Because you can get player A and player B both as good as each other on Definitely. the pitch. So then what's the difference? Things like their coachability. And then stuff like just habits off the field, mm -hmm. that extra one percent. Yeah, um, and, and we'll talk. We'll talk about uh, Matt. We'll talk about the the coaching as we go on. Yeah, yeah. But because we've started, we'll talk about what gives them that extra uh, percent in every aspect of their life. And one of the things that parents need to be super, super careful with, which I'm a dictator with at home with both my kids, is sleep yeah so they have to uh so my daughter hands her phone in at 7 p.m and she's had it for a couple of hours after school uh if she hasn't had activities and stuff and my son hands it in at 8 p.m and uh, how old are they uh, my son's 18 now just turned 18 and my daughter is 10 and are they athletes yeah so my son's with fulham um and he's a pro with Fulham and my daughter is wanting to become the best tennis player on earth. Class, class. <laughs> so uh, I don't know why she picked tennis to be honest uh, but she loves it and she and can spend hours doing it by that's, herself. That's class. Mm -hmm. Have they bought into your direction because we we often have even like famous footballers <clears throat> where I might have done sessions with their children and they might say oh sean can you tell them this because they don't listen to me i'm telling yeah. them to tidy their room i'm telling them to do this but have you got that relationship with them where they do listen yes they do um but they listen from a point from the point of view that they've seen especially with my son he's seen because i used to bring him to the to the track for example when i was an athlete i used to bring him to the track and he was a one-year-old and I used to sit him on the side of the track and he used to watch myself, Marlon Devonish, um, Mark Lewis Francis, both of those guys won the Olympics with Britain for the four by one. So he used to watch us all technically running correct. And so all of that information, all that stimulus was going in. Like osmosis. Yeah. Then he, I used to bring him to the gym and he used to watch David Haytrain, Amir Khan, um, Callum hudson Adoy, John Terry, um, you know, Dina, he's seen all of those guys and he's seen, oh, wow, okay. So if I just put the work in, then I can get to where they are, yeah? But at the same time, it's I've got had the same problem as every other parent, which is getting him off, off the phone, um, explaining to him, and he's been receptive. And one of the things I started doing with him years ago was when he was 11, I think he said... Uh, Oh, on Friday nights, can I play PlayStation, please, for an hour? So I said, okay, no problem. And then I started to notice that the following day, he was asleep on the pitch. Mm. 
So I used to go and watch him and I used to look at him and go, oh my God, he's just watching the game go past. Like, he's not involved. Do they use a whoop tracker or something to track their sleep? No, 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 no. I, I, we switch off all Wi-Fi. Um, that's the other thing. We don't track sleep like that because okay. it's to do with Wi-Fi. And so all Wi-Fi, there's no... Uh, we've painted their rooms in a certain way so no Wi-Fi radiation can mm -hmm. be in the room. Um, and we switch off the Wi-Fi at night. So so they, they you can get a proper night's sleep because that is a huge thing. So Definitely. Sleep. And so what we found out was, okay, no more PlayStation. You're going to do, kind of found this out by accident because he was studying for exams, but on Friday nights he started doing a lot more maths than he normally would. And then the next day he would play amazingly well. <laughs> so we kind of kept that going. Um, mm. and, um, yeah, so I have, I've had the same par uh, problem as other parents with food and this and that and the other, but where I, you just have to sit them down and say, look, you do it your way. Yeah. And if it works, great, we'll carry on. And it never does. And if it doesn't work, we'll do it my way. That's and class. That's, yeah. Because so then they have, they have their own choice. They have, yeah. they feel like they're not being, you know, and it, with some things it works, with other things you have to be more of a dictator and you have to get firm with it Okay. and all the rest, especially with boys, because anyone <clears throat> listening to this who has boys, they'll know boys are a strong character Yeah. Uh, for the most part. And so did my son. So uh, I think discipline has been one of the biggest factors in both him, his mum and myself have taught him a lot of discipline. So I remember when he was maybe eight, nine, he kept forgetting his water. Right. to go training and I was like listen I can't be responsible for your stuff when we leave the house I'm not going to look for your football boots I'm not going to look for your kit I'm not going to do any of those things if I'll drive you because you can't drive yourself but when we get there if anything's missing it's on you and he kept forgetting his water and you know did the parent thing okay you've forgotten your water let's uh, stop off and get you some water and then I said to him one day I said that's enough we'll never get your water again Okay, don't forget your water. And it was a hot day in July or August. We went to a tournament and he forgot his water. So he said, oh, can we please, the last time, stop. I said, no. I said, I wasn't going to do that again. So we went to this tournament. I think it was like 30 degrees and he played football the whole day and he couldn't drink any water. And when he got home, his lips were broken. You know, <laughs> he looked in a bad way. He never forgot his water again. Yeah. You know, so I think it's, it may sound cruel. But I think I was listening to a psychologist the other day where he was saying, do not be a friend to your children as you're trying to teach them discipline mm -hmm. and how to succeed in life. Do not try to be a friend to them and be like, oh, yeah, no, it's OK. Yeah, no, we're friends. And that. No, be their parent. You can. Now my relationship with my son has completely changed. He's 18. So we become friends. But mm -hmm. before then, everything was I was his parent and I was trying to teach him discipline and great habits and things that would help him on later on in life and i think that i've done that my brother and i <clears throat> we are very very forgetful people mm -hmm. and we look back to a lot with our mum how she would literally do anything for us we'd forget our lunch and we might be able to like ring our, up our mum and say oh could you bring me some lunch, please? Like, mm -hmm. And then she would do that. Yeah. And then, like, you know, we'd make mistakes, forget our keys on things, and she would, like, always solve our problems. And it probably has affected us badly in our adult life. Mm -hmm. So we've linked that back. And, yeah, I completely but remember, agree. But remember, that, that's, yeah. that's, that's a nurturing job from a woman okay. so, point, point of view. So women are like that, especially mm -hmm. with their sons and their children. They, they want to do those things because that's inherently who they are. Whereas as males, we have to teach our, especially the boys. So, yeah. for example, I used to shout at my son. Right. I used to grab him hard once in a while and go, okay. what the hell is wrong with you? Wake up. You know, right. that kind of thing. I've never raised my voice to my daughter. Interesting. Ever. So with girls, I found that they, they listen more. Mm. <laughs> so you can sit them down and reason with them from a very young age. Whereas you can't do that with boys as much. So... Um, yeah, it's just about understanding the boy-girl dynamics. I think that um, everything you're saying, like, 100% agree with. And it's the um, it's just that constant, constant 
culture that you're trying to create. Yeah. Because we even do, well, I do little things that I try to just subtly implement a lot of what you're saying. So just a little example of um, when I'm coaching somebody, if um, if the lace uh, becomes undone and they have to do their lace up, it's uh, it's like, right, you're doing your lace up again. If it comes undone again, there's a little forfeit. Mm -hmm. um, or if you know you struggle to do really tight knots, ask a coach, go and ask that or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's you're responsible for that. So if you tie it up, or if you ask somebody else to tie it up for you, it's fine. But it's your job. If that lace comes undone again, yeah. Then, yeah. If it's you that tied it, you get the forfeit. Or we make a little joke of it. It's like well, if Dad tied it, and it comes undone, Dad has to do the forfeit. Mm -hmm. But it's just that whole how you do something is how you do everything. Mm -hmm. And just those little habits and just building that constant culture of being responsible, and always just making sure that. You're not kind of letting anything slide. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Listen, when I was when I was training with uh, my when I was uh, towards the end part of my athletics career, my coach was Limpet Christie. I don't know if you remember Limpet. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what a goat! And yeah. he took us to San Diego, and we were training at the Olympic Training Center. And for lunch times, we had different eating partners. So sometimes I'd sit down and train and eat with I don't know. Um, a, an American football player or uh, a swimmer and one of my eating partner, partners once was um, Phelps um, and uh, I forget his first name Michael Michael Phelps um, and we were talking I, I actually heard him say this the other day as well we were talking and first of all his plate I had uh, I had a bit of chicken yeah on my plate yeah some sweet potato and some broccoli and he had the most incredible amount of food I have ever seen. I, had eat I don't know how a human being could eat that much wow. food. And it was like turkey, chicken, beef, um, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, all on top with gravy, with this uh, macaroni cheese. And I remember saying to him, why do you eat that much food? And he said, because if I don't, I won't have the amount of calories I need in order to swim as much as I do. Yeah. Um, and he was he we were talking and he said to me that he didn't miss a training session for five years wow he swam every single mm -hmm. day for five years and and I, I was like this is incredible so what do you do when you're ill he said i work around it wow yeah and that's why he became michael phelps and everything is about as i've gotten older i've realized everything is about discipline and mm. good habits mm. and some people will fail in life just because of their habits. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, you are the sum of all the habits that you are. Definitely. So you wake up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you may or may not take a shower, you use the toilet, you get dressed, you go to work, you go to training, or you do whatever you need to do, and you do the same thing every single day, week, month, year. Now, whether those habits are successful or not will determine whether you're successful or not. Yeah. You know, and that's one of the things that fascinates me. And James Clear is one of my favorite people that speaks on habits mm -hmm. and designing habits to link to your goals that you're setting for yourself. Yeah. Um, I really want to take it back to discipline, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Uh, because I know pro people probably get a little bit bored of how much I always talk about this boy Khalil, who's at Chelsea, mm -hmm. in the, playing a year up in the under 12s. But, but a lot of people would say, who know in football, would say he's one of the top players in Europe. Mm -hmm. So he's been involved with our company from a young age. And so I got to see his development. And we even did a podcast with his dad to understand how he raised Khalil. Like, really, like, what is going on? Like, because I've, I can't remember a kid that I've coached that took in information at, as much as well as Khalil. Mm -hmm. So in the episode, he talked about not babying Khalil. He talked about habits, discipline. And he, he, there were examples like he would always go to bed at 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. like no matter what. I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure it was 8 p.m. No matter what. Even when he'd be staying at his grandma's house, and this would when Khalil would be only like seven years old, eight years old, he would actively go to his grandma, who might have been willing to say, you can stay a bit later. Mm -hmm. And he would say, it's time for me to go to bed. Yeah. And then adding to that, they had a routine of burpees and push-ups and sit-ups before going to bed. And that routine has been like ingrained and built in. And that to me, like that's really inspiring. That's aspirational. You know, mm -hmm. I look up to that and I see some other parents that are doing similar things. We interviewed a boy 
parents of Naz, who's one of the top players at Leicester. You know, there's similar mindsets with that. But then I've seen it with another extreme. Like back in the day, I remember being involved with a parent who ended up, they put social services onto the parent. <laughs> he lifted up his kid by the neck. Yeah, and that that was too far. Like it's too, too. So how do you strike the right balance? You say, okay, so I'm not suggesting for one second that lifting a child up by the neck is right. Good. But I grew up <clears throat> in a generation where we didn't get smacked, we got beaten. Okay. Yeah. So uh, my dad, who is a major disciplinarian, used to beat me hard. Right. Um, and I turned out fine, <laughs> you know, um, and... So I'm not suggesting that it's okay. Yeah. Um, but I am suggesting <clears throat> that parents aren't as tough on their kids nowadays as they used to be. But isn't part of that, sorry, but I don't have children, but mm -hmm. like some friends have said that there's stuff now in some of the schools where if they hear from a kid or they say something, which like... I've done my child welfare courses, mm -hmm. so I understand this stuff needs to be in place. Like there needs to be access where if children are being abused, they can speak up and they've got Absolutely. the access. So, so we, we need that. But then I then know that some parents are like quite fearful of the kid accidentally saying something that they don't quite mean, but then that then gets reported and escalated yeah, so quickly. Absolutely. And this is where it's it's there's such a grey area with parenting. Yeah. Because you know, I was, I was raised by getting whipped and beaten right. a lot. Yeah. And I promised myself I would never do that with my children. Okay. But I did promise myself that I would never be soft on them, because if you're under any illusion that the world is easy, yeah, you've got other things coming. And I wanted to prepare them to make sure that they were physically, mentally, and spiritually tough in order to succeed. Um, and if like, for example, with the water, some parents might look at this and listen to this and go, oh my God, that's too harsh and all the rest of it. I didn't have to beat my son to get him to drink, to take, to be responsible for his own things. I just said, this is your last few warnings. Today's your last warning. I'm not going to be responsible for your water. And then since then, he was at boarding school uh, before he joined Fulham. And he was the the house mistress would write on the back of the door that whenever there were prospective parents and students being shown round, that they go to his room to to show what a dorm room looked like. The, the cleaners would leave notes for him and say, thank you so much because there's never anything to do in your room because his discipline was, I wake up, I make my bed, it's immaculate. When you'd open his drawers, all his underwear was color coordinated and folded, his socks, everything. So he would always complete his assignments on time or early because he just got into, into habits that at first seemed harsh, but then helped him become a very, very well oiled machine that then found time for everything because he was so well organized. Do you think high levels of discipline link to high levels of self-love absolutely if you if you do not if you don't have the discipline to you know like for example who doesn't like good food yeah we all like good food we all uh, most people like uh, i've got a weak spot for for sweet things um but i deny myself those things most of the time because i know that they're not good for me if i'm eating those things at home i'm teaching my children the wrong thing and more importantly i want to be able to perform like i am today for the next 50 60 years otherwise what's the point so i'm not going to be eating things that i know i shouldn't especially now that i have the amount of knowledge that i have about food i'm not going to be doing those things and that's self-love mm -hmm. you know so allowing yourself to once in a while say it's Christmas and you want to eat me in pies and whatever it is, fine. But then the rest of the time, you can't be doing that, those things on a daily basis because then 
you're showing that not only do you not have discipline, but you don't love yourself okay. because this is the only, this body is the only thing that you can do things in. You can have fun. You can, you know, make a career out of football, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever it is that you want to do. Um, and if you don't look after it, it's going to let you know about it. Mm. But it's so closely linked to the mind as well. Yeah. But like, again, in the last, I think it's been maybe the last eight weeks, I've basically given up sugar. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about Christmas coming up and I'm thinking, oh yeah, but I might have some mince pies, like it'd be a normal person. Mm -hmm. But then I'm thinking, but what if that breaks my habit? Because I'm finding such clarity of thought in these recent weeks. Mm -hmm. And I'm also feeling proud of myself that I can do something very, very difficult. And I feel that's leveled me up from a business point of view yeah, recently. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, from back in 2004, I've been practicing um, fasting. No, from back in 2000, I've been practicing fasting and autophagy. You know what autophagy is? No. Where you don't eat for days. Right. Um, and the longest I've done is 21 days. I've just had water. Now, what that did, because when I had to retire from track and field because I had Achilles tendon problems. Um, and when I started practicing autophagy, that went away. And now I realize why, because I've read all the, the research behind it. And autophagy just basically is your body eating itself. Um, because it's got no food, but what it does is it forces the body to regenerate new cells from old and dead cells. Mm. Yeah, so the amino acids are still locked within those cells. It goes in, breaks them up, and builds new cells. So you heal a lot quicker. Now, very important, do not, I, I believe children shouldn't be fasting, um, or definitely not doing autophagy, okay. um, because they're growing, they need food all the time um etc etc but now and as i'm getting older i find that that works for me now when christmas comes around i'm like i'm always like okay i'm gonna enjoy christmas okay yeah i'm not going to take liberties but i'm going to enjoy christmas for whatever it, if i'm going around to a friend's house or family i'm not gonna say no no i'm not gonna eat that because i don't do that for most of the year now from the first of january i'll start my fasting again and I do that for my own personal and selfish reasons, which are I get really bad hay fever. Like, it's terrible. I, I literally get fevers. Um, but I found that if I don't eat wheat, dairy and sugar from the 1st of January until the 1st of October, I don't get hay fever. And I can, I don't have to take allergy tablets, nothing. It literally does not bother me one inch. Mm. So that's why I do that. So you, you always do things for your own personal, and as long as you know why, then and you have a goal, then it makes a huge difference to what you're going to be doing. So when you get these new athletes that come to you, yeah. and you're coming in with these quite extreme methods, mm -hmm. what's their reaction? Well, if you're thinking about it, the, meth the methods aren't extreme. All you're doing is saying things like, by the way, next time you're buying toothpaste, don't buy that one. Just move your hand along a little bit more <laughs> and buy that one. Yeah. So it's not really extreme. Yeah. But I do educate them so that they can then make their own choice. Okay. Yeah. So. But what about alcohol? Uh, yeah. I suppose that I'm asking things like about alcohol. These are the things with adults. We want to link it to children because we do yeah. want to link this back to football development. And, and so you, what was the boy's name who's at Chelsea playing a year up? Khalil. Khalil. So with Khalil, it makes sense from the little bit that you just said which is he goes to bed at eight o'clock every night and all the rest of it. Your body, your mind can only assimilate the work it's done throughout that day if it gets enough sleep. So if he's getting loads of sleep, he's building new neural pathways at a much quicker rate than a child who's going to bed at nine or 10 or 11. So every day he wakes up and not only has his body rested, but so has his mind and it's re it's, it's leveled up. So from a, from a, performance point of view i always say sleep then hydration and for me water is like so important i could sit here and talk to you for hours on water and what it does and the fact that when you're born you're about 90 percent water when you reach adulthood you're about 75 to 85 percent water and then when you die you're 50 percent water 
So from the moment you're born, you're fighting dehydration. And that's why the rate at which you recover is very, very dependent on the water you're drinking, the quality of the water you're drinking and how much water you're drinking. So just sleep and water, if a parent listening to this will go, okay, I could do those things. I can get my son or my daughter to go to bed earlier and I can get them to drink a bit more water, you know? But I want to find the level to that. Under 12, I understand that it's meant to be 80% REM sleep for children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you've talked about removing the phones at a certain time. Are there any other practices you have to enforce that the child gets the most amount of REM sleep possible and the best quality of sleep? I think that's, sorry, there's the... That's like the important part that I try and get across to people is mm -hmm. the learning comes in between the training. Yeah. It doesn't happen during the training. No, so doing a session, yeah. the actual session itself isn't teaching the player. It's they do the session, they go away yeah. and it's when they're sleeping, when they're thinking about in their head what they did subconsciously without knowing it, they're mm -hmm. thinking back yeah. to that session. That's when the learning's taking place. Yeah. Yeah. And they'll come back, do another session, mm -hmm. they get all that repetition in again whilst they're doing those drills, whilst they're doing that repetition. The improvement isn't happening there. No. It's they go yeah. away, they think about it, they rest. That's when the improvement's happening. Yeah. And they come back and they'll be better. Yes, because of the drills and the repetition, but because of outside of that. And that's why visualization and uh, manifestation works. Because you're doing it, so your, your body doesn't, your mind doesn't um, realize the difference between subconscious and conscious. Yeah, so anything you're doing subconsciously, you think it's, you're actually doing it, and that's why it works. So that's what I one of the things that I get my children to do is five minutes of visualization a day, and to actually feel, for example, if they score a, for my son, if he scores a goal, what does that feel like? And going through that, all of those emotions and how the goal actually happened to set it up. Don't just think, oh, I'm in front of goal and I'm shooting and I'm scoring. And there's a centre back now and a right back, um, but I get them. I get him to to think about those things on a on a daily basis because then that adds to the training, and then with the right amount of sleep, he's progressing at a very very quick rate. Because you've got to remember, he's been at Fulham since July. He went in when he was 17, so he got a second year scholar, and then uh, he got two year pro. He hasn't been in an academy like most of those boys that he's playing with now have been at Fulham since they were six seven years old so he hasn't had that level of coaching but what he did have was a tremendous work ethic and well uh, thought out plan to make sure that when he did have an opportunity he could take it because he actually went in at Fulham when he was I think 12 and I was I was training David Hay at the time yeah um, and I couldn't get him to training and my my wife had had uh, our daughter um, and she she couldn't drive him all the way to North London we, we lived outside of London and so the coach that he had at the time, Sean Daly, is an amazing coach. Uh, works with Luton now. Oh, from North London. Yeah, yeah. I know Sean. Yeah, so um, Sean said, right, he needs to carry on training and playing football because we just kind of started with Sean. And so he said, um, let me find out if someone can give him a trial so he can carry on getting training and playing games whilst you're training David for this training camp. Um, and the closest to where we lived was Fulham. So he went in at Fulham and he did really, really well. Yeah. Um, and we didn't think he was going to get a review, but he got a review at the time. And uh, they just basically said, look, you've got potential, but you're just technically not good enough. You're not good enough with this, that and the other and blah, blah, blah. And so we were like, oh, thank you. Thank you for the feedback. Um, and But I knew where he would be now. And now the coach that he's got under 18s was actually the coach that he had when he was there on trial mm -hmm. and he remembered him um, and he was in on trial at Fulham for five days and they offered him this thing because he went in and I knew physically technically uh, 
maybe not tactically, but those things, he was good tactically, don't get me wrong, but not, you know, he, need, he needs, and players always need more work with those things. But so, he was he was ready to take the opportunity, and I knew he would be, because I didn't want him to be good at 12. Yeah. I wanted him to be good when it mattered. Yeah. So just just before, because I, I love the, hearing the, the story about your son, because I want to know more about that. Yeah. So like his grassroots and stuff. Yeah. But, um, I think the most because we're talking about like takeaways that parents can do. Mm-hmm. Um, just visualization is something I know a lot about and I've done a lot in the past mm-hmm. with people I've worked with. And I think that is such an easy takeaway. Yeah. Because anyone can do it. Yeah. And it's literally a parent in the car with their child for five minutes before they go and play a game. Mm-hmm. It, it's definitely something that parents should go and read up on. And it's just the it is one of the simplest and easiest things they can do and most effective. Yeah, it, it, visualization. I'm such a massive fan. And of. it costs it nothing. It costs nothing. <laughs> yeah, and it, it is literally just a parent in the car that replaying things that are potentially going to happen in the match. How, how you're going to deal with it? How's it going to make you feel? But, um, but such a powerful tool. See, yeah. see, I don't necessarily know that it's definitely in the car. I mean, I'd written a note down to like come back to make sure I asked you about visualization in more detail. Yeah. Because I also want to continue on making sure we hear the journey from your son. Mm-hmm. But. Yeah, if we just stick into visualization in what that looks like for you, because you said it's five minutes a day, but where is it? Like when they come home from school, are you saying, what's your daughter's name? Savannah. Savannah. And what do you say? Uh, Son's name Sam. Yeah, Samuel, yeah, Sam. Okay. So you say to them, right, guys, we're coming to do visualization now. Like, what? How does it happen? Interestingly, our daughter does mindfulness. Yeah. So she gets the whole family together sometime in the evenings. And she rings her little bell oh. and she gets us all to close our eyes and she goes through a meditation that she's learnt at school. Wow. Um, and it's so calming because she has such a calming voice. And just doing those kind of things um, are super important. And I find them super cute. So I, I always encourage it. But then uh, the reason why I say no phones especially a few hours before, at least a couple of hours before you go to bed is because of the blue light and, you know, all, all what that What about with Apple? They reduce the blue light, don't they? Yeah, but those things, they're, they, they're stimulating. They're very stimulating. Remember, whatever you're looking at, your subconscious doesn't know whether it's real or not. It thinks it's real. So all of those things, if you're watching things that may cause adrenaline, you'll, you'll release adrenaline because, again... It, just like if you're watching a fast action film and all of these uh, TikTok and YouTube uh, shorts, I think they're called or whatever, they're, they're very, very quick and everything's getting quicker and quicker and quicker because it's supposed to be stimulating and not boring. So I always say stop that, read a book, um, do your visualization, start getting ready for bed. It's part of your routine. There's no, there is no way on earth that you should be switching your phone off as you're falling asleep, you know? And do your top athletes, do they all do this? Yeah, every single last one of them does. And I always recommend it. And they always, you can always tell if someone's not doing what they're supposed to be doing because you can see it in their numbers, in their performance. Um, And I... Uh, one of my trade secrets is something called power endurance right. um, and it's I don't want to do it a disservice by saying it's similar to CrossFit but it is um, but it's very very specific for the sport that the person is doing and it allows them to be able to if you're a sprinter yeah, it allows you to be able to hit the ground with power for every single stride from start to finish. If you're a boxer, it allows you to punch hard and as hard as you can from first, from round one to round 12. But it is so tough. <clears throat> so when I was an athlete, I used to spend nine months training and getting strong and fit so that I could do four weeks of power endurance then before my season. Yeah. Um, and today I don't... I've not seen anyone do it um, and that's one of the advantages I give my athletes when they come to see me um, and if they're not sleeping and they're not doing the things that they're supposed to be doing there's no way they'll recover from it. How does WHOOP 
be a multi-billion pound business mm -hmm. measuring sleep because I also turn my wife off at night. I've yeah. had the same thing. So I do that, but I do keep the whoop on mm -hmm. because they say that you can still have that and it doesn't interfere with your sleep. You just, in the morning, you then turn your Wi-Fi back on, you put your phone off airplane mode and then it then can sync up and then it can tell you the data for how much REM sleep you got, how much light sleep there was. Yeah. I think I think there's an over-reliance, in, in my opinion, there's an over-reliance on, on uh, data and technology. Um, I mean, when when I'm training an athlete to be faster, there's just I'll, I'll give you an example when i started training dina uh when the, the year that i was training dina to become world champion 2019 um i got um i told her when she first started training with me i said you're gonna get slower first and if that doesn't scare you i promise you you're gonna be so fast because we have to build a bit bigger engine. But in order to build a bigger engine, we need to get slower because we're gonna to have to do a lot of strength work and strength work makes you slower. Now, where I've been lucky enough is finding how, is finding out from all of the things that I've studied, but primarily from experience, when you go from strength to power and then turn that into speed. Mm. And that is a very specialized thing. I, I wouldn't have known how to do this years ago. Yeah. I know now I know how to do it in my sleep. So she got slower. And then the Federation and everyone else were saying, oh, my God, she's slower because they were testing her all the time. And I said, yeah, I know she's slower. I told her she was going to be slower. I told you guys she was going to be slower. And um, she doesn't need to be fast until October 2019. And we're in January. Yeah, so it's 10 months. <laughs> so please, let's just, yeah. Um, and they were panicking and panicking and panicking. And in the end, I said, okay, let's let's show them. Yeah, so we started doing a bit of power. And she was almost a tenth of a second quicker over the first 10 meters. Wow. And in sprinting world, especially yeah. for an athlete who's already at elite level, is huge. And then... Um, I was like, okay, there you go, proved it. Now can we go back? Because we've got my, my peak for her is in October. And then we went back and then we did power endurance. And then she came out and she was destroying people by huge distances. So um, that sounds like what Tiger Woods did with changing his swing at a certain time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, you have to be patient. So with my son, he was doing technical weight sessions from the age of about eight. What are technical weight sessions? So he was squatting with one kilo, for example, but we were making sure that he could technically squat by mechanically squat correctly. And he stayed on one kilo for years. He was so bored of it. It was like, everyone else is lifting weight. I said, I don't care. Yeah. And then when he started lifting, he went past everybody really quickly. Then he's we've kept him uh on a hundred kilo squat for a long time and then the other day in the gym he got excited yeah <laughs> and i wasn't there and he deadlifted 160 and so he he said how could i go from 100 to 160 and it still felt like 100 and i said because you've done 100 for such a long time it's part it's and that's what people don't understand about strength work you don't really you don't necessarily have to keep lifting heavier and heavier and heavier but as long as you're lifting heavy with the correct technique and you're getting stronger but you're doing over a long uh, a length of time when you need to you can lift super heavy and that's why uh, that's what an, another reason why i don't believe in maximum strength tests because they can get you injured and i know a lot of academy youngsters who have had injuries at clubs where they've done the, um, what's it called, IKD machine? Um, you know, when uh, they make you do like a leg extension mm -hmm. um, to see what your, and the hamstring curl to see what your maximum power is. There's no need to make a 16 year old do that because the strength that they've got mm -hmm. at 16 is gonna be <clears> different <throat> to the strength that they've got at 18 and then 21. So what's the point? And the risk for injury is huge. I've actually, now helping a boy who got injured at a uh, 
a Premier League club uh, where they were doing that and the machine caused a, 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 a tearing his quad. And I was like, why you? Why does he need to do a maximal test? He's still growing. Um, it's like they're obsessed with um, making sure that kids are fit and all the rest of it from too early on in their life. And their lactate system, a child's lactate system, doesn't develop fully until after 13. So why concentrate on fitness before then when you can concentrate on speed and make them fast? And then when they start developing their lactate, so they're going to be fit anyway because they're running around on the pitch for, for, for however, what, what is it, 80 minutes? 90 minutes. No, what do under 12s, under 13s mm. play? Probably about that, 80 yeah, minutes. Yeah, yeah something yeah, like yeah, that. Sorry. Um, so concentrate on things that will help them in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so but, like their speed so and their on, athleticism. Yeah, on that, the, so there's a lot of back and forth about how early to start S&C stuff. So I love mm -hmm. when you said start it at eight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because it's, because um, a lot of people will argue when they go through maturation, everything changes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it does. But if you start that early, one, you're building the habit and the knowledge of the importance of that work. Mm -hmm. So then when you do start doing it after maturation, 15, 16, yeah. it's not alien to you. No. So you understand the context of it and it's kind of just part of what you're going to be doing in your training program. Mm -hmm. And then two, it's so much more quicker to nail correct technical movements if you've been taught them before as well. It will yeah. change slightly because yeah. your growth spurts mm -hmm. and you, you might go from 5'5 five, five to 6'2 quite quickly. So there'll be a lot that changes. But then having to teach a movement pattern to somebody that hasn't done any work after maturation is harder and it'll take a lot longer teaching that movement pattern to somebody that they might not have been doing um, heavy weights, yeah. but you've been doing and your joint, work. And your joints and, stiffen around 13 years old anyway. Um, so if you can get flexible movements uh, like squatting, most, ch my, most children can squat thumb to floor and then stand up without using their hands like it's nothing. And then as they start getting older, they start being able to do that less and less and less. Then you're asking someone to, you know, run and do certain football movements because we're talking about football um, where they have less flexibility because they haven't worked on it as they've gotten older. And that's where injuries start to creep in. So I was going to say, sorry, the other thing I was going to say was what you mentioned as well. Just because somebody's working at an academy isn't necessarily That's what mean I was going to ask. Mm -hmm. They are the best person. So, 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 yeah, so that, but then I just wanted to like ask on this because realistically, a parent who's worked so hard to get their child signed to an academy, mm -hmm. the academy are looking for parents that are difficult parents, parents that don't toe the line. Mm -hmm. Realistically, are we suggesting that when the S and C coach says, "Right, I want you to." do your max rep on this now a parent said i've listened to this podcast and i don't want you to do that do they stand up to that coach yeah i mean that's a that's a really good and difficult question because um at the end of the day look i know how hard it is once you go into an academy and uh one of the reasons why a lot of coaches just don't speak to parents is because they have to hear from parents who may not necessarily know what they're doing and so they're trying to tell them how to do their job where they don't really understand. That's why when Samuel was uh, growing up and he was playing football, I wouldn't shout at him from the side of the pitch because I'd give him instruction. Someone else might shout at him and then that person didn't know why he was doing what he was doing. Yeah, but it was for his own development. And so... It's 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 a hard one. I think it also depends from case to case, club to club, about what what I think parents should be doing is going in and saying, my what are my child's weaknesses, for mm -hmm. example, um, and they, they'll always tell you, right? He's not quick enough. He's not athletic enough. He's not technically good enough. He doesn't do this or he doesn't do that. Yeah. Okay, what are you guys doing to solve those particular problems? And what can we do outside of the club? To help solve those particular problems because yeah. we understand that especially as they're growing up they're in two or three times a week you know the younger ones they won't be able to do a coach won't be able to to do everything that that child particularly needs 
So it's very important for a parent to go in and say, how can we do this? And then for them to look outside, uh, you know, that's, I did the same thing when I, when Samuel said to me, he's seven years old, he said, I want to be a footballer. I was like, okay, cool. So I went and took my FA football badges just to understand. And then I was training, a, I, was, I was telling you guys before, I was training a football player called Morris Waltz who played for Arsenal oh, yeah. and Fulham. Yeah. And I said, Moritz, I want to come to Hamburg. He was playing at towards the end of his career. He said, I want to come to Hamburg and I want to understand how they train youngsters mm -hmm. in Germany. And then whilst I was there, I met another footballer and he gave me the opportunity to go and see how Bayern Munich were training their, mm. their um, academy youngsters. I got to, through John Terry, see how Chelsea were doing it. And I just started to immerse myself mm. in the world of, okay, that's the footballing aspect. Yeah. How does that need to marry with the strength and conditioning and performance aspect of things? So as a parent, to answer that question, yeah. is I think you should be you should be uh, prudent with how you approach it. Yeah. And you should always realise that the clubs have the best interest of producing a player. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no reason why that shouldn't be your child, but the club can't do it all. But you said that there's a really high risk of injury yeah. if you're doing a max rep. Yeah. So... I don't. I personally don't. If I was training a football club, I wouldn't do max rep testing. But uh, you think it does go on in a lot of academies? Yeah, from what I know, yes, it does. So let's say that a scenario: mm -hmm. Sam is signed. Let's say Arsenal. Mm -hmm. Let's just say, and let's say that he's in there under twelve, and maybe you've told him, you, you've said, "I don't want you ever to do a max rep. We don't do that." Mm -hmm. And he's he has understood that. And then he goes into Arsenal and then they're saying, right, we're going to do a next rep. Are you going to say to him, say, no, you don't do it. You refuse. No, he had to do max testing when he got signed at Fulham. Right. Um, because that was the requirement for them to see if he was physically able to to handle whatever they thought. They so you just had to, to eat that. You just went. Well, yeah, them. I just said to him, no, I just said to him, listen, you're healthy and strong enough to be able to do your max test. All right. But I know he's healthy and strong enough. Um, and the reason I know that is because Samuel probably gets around 300 massages a year. Really? Um, and I was speaking to a parent the other day and they were like, oh, I can't afford to give my send my son to get that much massage. And I said, so you do it. Yeah. You do it. Grab some olive oil put a towel down in the living room or in his bedroom and put his calf or her calf on, on your lap and massage towards the heart. And then every time you find a little knot, just work away at it, not too hard, but just work away at it until it starts to, to go. And it's those kind of things that a parent can do, but you, you can't leave those things alone. And then when they get injured, expect the, the club to have done everything and all the rest of it. You need to find a way if you're serious about what your child needs to do. And if the child is serious, I, Samuel, we used to foam roll as well. A lot of the time when I wasn't around, he used to just put himself a foam roller and he used to foam roll and wherever he'd find a knot, he'd just work away at it. You know, Florin Maluda, mm -hmm. he used to do that with his son. I remember. Mm -hmm. And we were like, what? You're doing massage. He's only eight years old, mm -hmm. but I've seen it with, Hezzy Grimwade's mum does it with him. Yeah. Um, Ethan Freno, I know his mum does it with him. Like, that is happening. And so can you talk about, because I know Marcus Rashford, mm -hmm. he got told to stop doing massage okay. because they said that they wanted his body to learn how to recover itself. I think that's one of the issues with just football in general, especially at academies. Every academy has their own philosophy. And yeah. Like we were saying earlier, mm -hmm. people will come in and they have their opinion and there's almost a little bit of ego and arrogance within football yeah and then especially if you come in and you're working at a top club and you think i'm going to do it my way so then they do it their way so you've got somebody at man united wanting to do it their way and they're telling marcus I think this was at nike he went over to nike and started exactly. doing work with them in so you've got all of these like there, so-called experts so many voices are, yeah so many voices so many voices I'll and each voice is a, an apparent expert yeah and they're all saying a different thing i'll tell you what i think about that uh, with not doing massage to let your body recover itself. Uh, that's the same as way of saying, 
um, don't eat highly nutritious food, we just eat carbohydrates and protein and you let, you let your body, it's just, it's not going to happen. And <laughs> it's just from what everything that I know, it just, yeah. it's not going to happen. Right. I'll tell you every, the whole purpose of training yeah. is to tear a muscle micro tears yeah and then it repairs and heals itself and becomes stronger yeah and then you can come back again and you do the same thing and then over a period of time you become stronger fitter faster whatever yeah when you have micro tears in your muscles the body panics and says oh it doesn't understand that you're trying to become a footballer it just thinks there's micro trauma so we need to f repair this so it sends collagen sticky collagen um, to repair the muscles now because there's a bit of a panic it doesn't um, lay the collagen down in the same direction that the muscle fibers are running in it lays it down in a panic so the same way that you drop a box of matches and they go everywhere yeah that's how the body lays collagen all right so now you're asking muscles to glide over each other with bits of sticky collagen and micro trauma and tears that eventually is going to turn out in, in being something bigger. Yeah. So what you know, what I do, the people that I work with, we always massage and make sure that not only does massage get rid of toxins uh, and help flush out lactic acid, it also repairs, helps repair micro trauma. And so for that reason, you're able to then layer your training and get further and further ahead of everyone else who's not doing it. You know, I've literally seen this. After this, I'll show you guys some videos. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, just just to prove my point. Yeah. Um, but that I, I would never, I would never not recommend massage. I think it's crucial. So, so what age did your children start getting massages? Uh, I started getting Samuel used to massage at around three. Yeah. Um, I'd sit there and like start massaging his yeah. calves and stuff. Yeah. And he was wriggling. And then <laughs> when he was about seven, eight years old, he used to not like it at all. Okay. Um, my daughter did not let me give her a massage until just recently because she was like, it hurts and it tickles and I don't want it. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, so then, no problem. <laughs> right. No problem at all. Now she, un now she understands like, oh my God, my body feels funny that I need a massage. And then I'll massage her. And she'll be like, oh, I feel fantastic. Great. How then, long does that take? Um, so it can be anywhere from, depends if it's just massaging a, a specialized, you know, a local area. Yeah. So it might take 10, 15 minutes. And if, especially with Samuel, he's getting an all body massage. It might take an hour to two hours. Um, and I used to do the same thing for David Hay. I used to do the same thing for John Terry. I'm retired as I'm so now I only massage those two because uh, it's exhausting. Um, but with everyone, I can't recommend it enough with everyone that I've worked with. It makes a huge difference to how you recover and how you're able to lay a training and get better and better and better without any hindrances in your body. Yeah. It just makes, it, it yeah. doesn't make any sense to me not to get it. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, it's the same as why you you eat as uh, good a food and as highly nutritious food as you can possibly find and keep away from sugars and things like that which Definitely. cause inflammation which then will hinder your your recovery you know there's so many different things and it's about finding those little because look every every parent that is serious about their child becoming a footballer yeah. understands that they're going to have to give up large parts of their childhood because they can't have late nights and yeah. they can't eat things that they shouldn't and it's training here and there and driving them up and down the country for training sessions football games etc yeah. etc if you're going to if you're going to do that then sit down and have a, a uh, an honest and frank relationship with your child and conversation and say right if we're going to do this let's do it properly yeah mm -hmm. so let's try and and cover as many bases as we can like we said before that uh, you know go to bed early um start snc early and not just and you should never be doing heavy lifting with a young child uh, but you should be 
doing body weight exercises that then turn into like maybe lifting one or two kilos mm. so that it's so gradual that you get the benefits from it but you're you're getting long term you're looking at long term goals not short term yeah because like with samuel and savannah i've got no interest in them being wonder kids i could have trained two wonder kids that are, for example my daughter at 10 years old could be one of the best tennis players in the world it doesn't serve her at all she's had a 10-year holiday as i call it um because she's had the most amazing childhood and now from her she's like dad i want to train more i want to train more mm. and it's coming from her so the push is coming from her mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. she's gone to tournaments and her athletic ability has allowed her to win tournaments mm -hmm. but then when she faces girls who are a little bit older and boys mm. who are better at tennis and she's realized that she's like oh, okay i need more tennis and it's come you know so it's, yeah it's Intrinsic that realization it's, yeah yeah what's uh, yeah oh sorry i, was oh, gonna say, I don't want to um skip over your son's journey because yeah. it's interesting things. Mm -hmm. yeah and i want to get to that too mm -hmm. i probably just wanted to just touch on just why I'm enjoying listening to this so much <laughs> and probably you. parents are enjoying listening to this so much because you're talking about things like visualization, sleep, strength work, these things, but you when we're talking about it and they say, well, how do you do that in the reality? Because it's easy to say, right, yeah, I need my kids to get more sleep. But then when we say, yeah, but the kids don't listen to their parents. Mm -hmm. You're then giving the solutions where you're talking about the relationship that needs to be there and fostered around discipline. And then when you have that, then you can then start getting the sleep in order. And you're, you've shown how, look, you had some bad games and I've let you learn that by yourself. And the same thing with like the water example, there's like life lessons there that ended up getting those habits to be formed mm -hmm. and so and then with the visualization i loved how you described that because i was thinking as you're saying that i'm thinking parents are so busy how are they finding time to like get so yeah, say, yeah. Like, specifically with visualization so yeah. a really really simple and easy example i do it with my under nines mm -hmm. uh, before we play a game typically a team will warm up for as long as they can yeah and then there'll be a relatively brief team talk and then you play whereas our warm up finishes a long time before we kick off and I sit them down, we'll do the team talk and then it's visualization oh, nice. and then it's before they go and play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's an extra three or four minutes doing a quick passing drill going to do? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Mm -hmm. But I'll literally talk through each one of them. It's a nice one for my under nine parents to listen to because mm -hmm. they know what I do with them now before we play the match. But I'll say the player's name. You're going to be playing in this position for most of the time. You know, think about how you're going to deal with when the player's running at you with the ball. How you're going to defend that 1v1. Mm -hmm. Remember, and they'll just get, I'll talk them through a few scenarios mm -hmm. um, and then just get, you know, you're going to be centre forward for the majority of the game. That's what you're thinking about. Yeah, when you've got the ball at your feet, can you drop a shoulder, take a touch, and then just imagine when you put your foot through the ball and the ball hits the back of the net. So, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. yeah. There's, there's so much research yeah. that shows how. Just an example oh, of yeah, like, sorry. before the match for five minutes. Yeah, so yeah. Is, listen, there's more and more research coming out which shows the power of the mind, yeah. the power of water. Um, there's a brilliant video um, online which I show <coughs> everybody, which is what frequency does to water. I don't know if you've seen it, um, where this guy's hooked up um, a, a speaker and um, he's hooked up to a microphone and a different wavelength generator. And the, depending on how he turns the, the, the frequency of the, of the speaker up or down, he runs a tap and then the water changes. Yeah, it, it literally changes its shape. Really? Um, and I always say to people, if that's the power of positive thinking and positive talking. So if, that vibration can do that to water. That's why if you're 75 80 to 85 percent water and you're speaking positively, it'll change your vibration mm. over a long period of time. There's a there's an amazing uh, scientist called Dr. Masaru Moto, who um, if parents want to look this up and show their children. He's got books and he's got lectures on YouTube and stuff. And he literally started to freeze water and then 
take pictures of the crystals of the frozen water and he discovered that if you write something positive on the bottle or on the container of the, where the water is being held and then freeze it and then take pictures the crystals that it forms are beautiful and they're very symmetrical and if you write something negative they don't form at all but you can't see it under, with the naked eye you can only see it under the microscope and I think he's just won a whole bunch of prizes because he's proven without a shadow of a doubt that writing positive messages on water bottles and versus negative me messages and again he's proven it with prayer uh, positive words uh, negative words that it literally changes the, the frequency of the water. So can I hear some examples of how you bring that to your children? Okay so when when I um, when they're drinking yeah they we write messages on their water like what strength speed power um, creativity thank you uh, for for making me healthy you know like all of those kind of things which I, is on the outside of the bottle on the outside of the bottle marker. I used to do that with David Hay right. I used to love it I used to label all of his water um, uh, in his room and then he'd just pick up his bottles of water and just take them to the gym and stuff like that that's one of the reasons why David became undisputed and uh, cruiserweight champion of the world and then heavyweight champion of the world before Usyk he was only the second man in history to have done that and before him it was van der holyfield and david hay now alexander Usyk. and it was because he was just so receptive to all of these things i was talking about these things with him back in you know 2008 2007 changing toothpaste having coconut water coconut oil um superfoods in fact i bought, i used to formulate in my kitchen uh his supplements his daily vitamins mm. i used to put them together and then i would give them to him and i used to do the same thing for tiny temper before he used to go into the studio to I, I got him off red bull and he started taking these things and tiny actually be, when his tub was running low he'd go rubes my my supply is running low of whatever you've given me i need another one because mm. i find it incredible to go into the studio and now tiny's had more number ones than elton john uh, i don't think most people know that um david and both formulations i was asked by a company called the organic pharmacy to formulate two things um two formulas for a supplement as a collaboration yeah. and i did david hayes one that i used to do years ago and tiny tempers and one's called performance and the other one's called longevity performance oxygenates the brain it helps give you endurance and that kind of stuff and longevity is literally that gives you longevity lowers inflammation and i've given it to loads of different people with different health complaints and what's been really really nice for me is the feedback i've had from those people mm. they're like oh my god i've got i can't mention what they've had but i've had this and that and it's helped and now it's not there or whatever and that feels really good mm. and that's come from years of formulating stuff now the difference is I've actually, I did a lecture the other day on uh, natural vitamin C versus synthetic vitamin C and the supplements that you get in the market, it's all about margins for these companies. So for example, the vitamin B12 that I've had to put in my supplement is $7,000 per kilo cheaper, more expensive, sorry, than the one that's that are out in the market. And for me, it wasn't about the bottom line or anything like that. I wanted to put my name to something that that's the best and the margins are tiny but that's the best that you can possibly do your children have these supplements every day really yeah, yeah. that's what i was going to say i mean definitely want to get back to sam joining <laughs> we've got team. time we've got time <laughs> but, um because you've mentioned it <laughs> yeah uh just hear your thoughts on supplementation for kids yeah how young um what they should potentially be supplementing with okay so um food always wins over supplements interesting um and i understand that for example to get the same level of nutrition in food today versus 100 years ago i was just going to say it's different it because might... of modern farming practices yeah, yeah. the way that food gets farmed uh, grown so quickly fertilizers the food because it gets grown a lot quicker doesn't absorb as many nutrients from the soil i was talking to someone who's got diabetes type 2 
other day and I said to him, you need to start taking chromium because normally chromium would be in the vegetables, but it doesn't get absorbed uh, when food is grown that quickly. Um, so always, and for example, to have a carrot 100 years ago would have the same level of nutrition that four would have today. Mm. And so I understand that food isn't what it used to be. So that's where you may need to supplement, but it's about the right supplementation. Do you so, like A1 greens? I've not heard of A1 greens, but I'm sure it's like a whole bunch of greens like spirulina, chlorella. grass you know that it's the one that joe rogan advocates yeah so those kind of things are very good because um and especially if they're organic so they won't have pesticides in them and stuff because it'll help alkalize and there's always a war between acidity and alkalization going on in the body um and it will help lower inflammation help aid re recovery and all the rest of it plus we don't really absorb calcium from milk um especially if it's been pasteurized so i'm not going to get too technical with this stuff but yeah. um when so milk has an array of different um amino acids um essential and non-essential amino acids it has calcium um magnesium vitamin c omega-3 so but when it's pasteurized because it gets pasteurized between 120 and 140 degrees celsius everything in the milk is killed and they they pasteurize it to kill the bacteria because there's good bacteria in milk but just in case there's bad bacteria they pasteurize it unfortunately they pasteurize it they kill the bacteria but they don't fish the bacteria out so when you're drinking milk you're drinking dead bacteria really? if you think about it if you think about it it's just it's pasteurized right they don't then fish out the bacteria so like this so, coffee i'm having now is bacteria <laughs> that's bacteria oh dear. Um, and then that will start to toxify you a little bit I see. Um, and then it's got omega-3 milk yeah. has got omega-3 but because it's pasteurized at above boiling point for water um, it burns the fat so when you're drinking milk you're drinking burnt fat so that causes your inflammation to go up and then that slows down your recovery so and then why it's relevant to, to the a1 greens that you just mentioned yeah. and calcium is because calcium um, so grass absorbs calcium um, and then the cows eat the, the grass and then there's, there's calcium in the milk yeah but when the grass absorbs the calcium it absorbs it and it collates it so collation is the latin for claw so you get this amino acid claw and then calcium and then they attach together and you get a collated mineral and that's how your body absorbs it it doesn't really recognize the calcium it recognizes the amino acid and the amino acid gets sent like a postcode to wherever the calcium is needed. Yeah, teeth, bones, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, transport carrier system. Mm -hmm. So when the milk gets pasteurized, it destroys the amino acid, which is quite, you know, it's very fragile and volatile, and you get free floating calcium. Then body doesn't really know what to do with that. And so it sends it to wherever there's space, like the joints. And then later on, after years and years of that kind of stuff, you start getting stiff joints, etc etc so for that reason greens leafy leafy greens are the best source of calcium um so it's very important to make children eat leafy green vegetables and if they don't like them because i've had this before then hide them so for example my my son didn't like i can't remember what it was maybe it was kale and so i used to make him a strawberry smoothie with oat milk uh, or, or almond milk or something. And I used to put some, a handful of like kale in there and whiz it up and it still tasted like strawberries. I put a bit of honey, banana and stuff and he didn't know. So just just get creative with how you're you're doing things. And um, But the reason going back to, to supplementation, 
vitamin C, for example, made in a lab, is just um, ascorbic acid. Vitamin C found in nature is an eight molecule compound. So it's got seven different molecules and it's encased in the ascorbic acid, but they can't make that in a lab. So they just give you ascorbic acid, which kind of, but not really acts like the same thing. So natural vitamin C has rutin, which thins your blood. It has vitamins J, K and P, vitamin K is important for blood clotting, just in case you, you cut yourself. Um, it's got uh, an array of different enzymes, which help your body absorb the vitamin C, um, tyrosinase. And so when you have a uh, man-made vitamin C, yeah. your, your body then has to scavenge for the other things to make it a whole complex so then you can oh. use it. Yeah, whereas if you're having natural vitamin C, like acerola cherry, rosehip, uh, camu camu, um, berries, whatever, okay. yeah. then it's a completely different story. So we spoke off air and mm -hmm. you were saying that you're going to, release a program in the near future for parents who want their children to be athletes yeah. footballers and that's going to be available will there be nutritional advice oh, within that program 100 percent, it has to be that one of the things that i pride myself on is trying to to give a well-rounded form of information you could becoming a human being yeah uh, becoming a successful person and then becoming an athlete or whatever. It's a series of jigsaw puzzles, which you have to put together, you know? So it's, there's no point in just saying, right, um, your son or daughter is trying to become a footballer, so they need more speed work. So just releasing a, a speed program, because that's just one element of it. Um, they also need to be um, athletic and they need to have good proprioception and coordination so that they can turn quickly and um, they can become durable and they need to be technically good enough and you know all those things so um there's going to be rule, rules which you have to put in place and rules which can be flexible um and then there's the whole of the training program so we're gonna we've written one for um under nines under under tens under thirteens under sixteens and then under eighteens um and then the but pro one um so that because i get asked i was going over the same conversations yeah for the longest time with each individual parent yeah and i just thought you know what i'm just going to put this down so that it's a it's a resource because when i started helping samuel i scoured the internet i had conversations with uh rio ferdinand um thank you by the way rio um um thierry Henry. Uh, Jamie Redknapp, uh, with all of the people that I was I was training and had access to, I just thought, you know what? Let me have as many of these conversations with these people and see what the underlying theme is. And I remember Rio once said to me that the Germans, why they're good when they get to tournaments, is their youngsters play so many tournaments throughout the summer that. For them taking penalties and the tournament um structure is just second nature um so i took samuel's <clears throat> ascot team because i was uh, i became their their coach and in the summers we'd play tournament after tournament after tournament um and then they became really really good at playing tournaments and started winning i think when he was an under 12 they won everything they won like 17 tournaments in the summer Mm -hmm. um, but it took from them playing tournaments from the age of about seven all the way through to learn to adapt, you know, so it's that kind of thing. If, if I so, could interject with just that yeah. point, because I'm thinking maybe some parents might misconstrue that because I know that there needs to be a holistic program with yeah. football development. And I see there's some coaches that enter a ton of tournaments, mm -hmm. but they're not doing the other work in football development. You know, they'll play and they're not doing the technical work that needs to be there. So individually, like my teams that I've had, I might not do any tournaments for a while. Let's say it's like an under six, under seven group. Let's just say I might contain them, just work for a long time, just getting them how I need them to 
play out from the back or just what I need to introduce to them. And then at a certain time, I'm saying, all right, let's do some tournaments now. It, yeah, it's interesting you say that because when I got asked to train Samuel's team at Ascot, they gave me Samuel, because he's my son, yeah. and they gave me a whole bunch of boys who weren't in the A team. I got like the C team, for example. Right. And I said to the parents, listen, we're not going to play any football. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, we're not going to play any football because they can hardly kick a ball. We're just going to do technical stuff and athletic stuff. And I'm going to turn them into athletes. Give me a year, please. <laughs> and then we'll, they can play as much football for the rest of their lives, under eight or whatever. But under seven, they're not going to do that. Can't join and, the orchestra until you master the instrument. Yeah. And so uh, some of the parents were not happy with it. Right. And they moved and they gave me different kids okay. and stuff. And those boys are under 12 when were unbeatable okay we were playing academies as well and beating academies and the boys who weren't athletic became athletes mm. because that's what i pride myself on i can tell anyone i can make anyone faster and more athletic um I, I, my favorite thing is when i hear that player is not fast okay give them to me give them to me and i'll make them faster i remember when samuel i can't remember i think we were playing qpr and I was in the lobby hearing a mum talk to one of the QPR coaches um, and they were saying, look, I know your son's been here since he was seven, but he's 14 now and he's not developed athletically and he's not quick enough, so we're going to have to let him go. Um, and I heard that. I was like, oh, my God. Um, <laughs> I, I wasn't supposed to hear that, but he, the, the mum was distraught and she was like, oh, my God, how am I going to do this, that and the other? And I just said to her, you should go back and ask how many speed sessions did they give your son? Yeah. Well, if Identify the weaknesses and how many speed sessions or the amount of times I hear that boy can't kick the uh, head the ball. But how many heading sessions have you done? How many heading practices, etc., etc. There's things that you can do. And if you're willing to talk about them in an open way, and especially with the club and at home and say, right, son, what do you think your strengths are? What do you, or daughter, Mm. Um, what do you think your strengths are, your weaknesses, and let's work on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's make you a bet and and find find uh, the the discipline and dedication and the want to get better in those little things and say, oh look, you couldn't head a ball before and you scored a headed goal. Goal, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, it makes a huge difference, especially to the child's confidence. You know, Samuel couldn't use his left foot, and uh, I put a different color sock on all the boys on oh, yeah. their weaker foot and I would encourage them to use that foot and when Samuel before. played Southampton so his school played Fulham and a week later they played Southampton and I didn't get to watch the Fulham game but I saw the Southampton game and I'm not just saying this if he ever plays that well again I'll, I'll be super happy what age group was that under 18 he's okay. the first year under 18 first year of A levels they, his school went to play Southampton and the, at the end, the academy director came up to me and said, look, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. You just saw what I saw. Um, we won him in. And I said, look, Fulham have asked for him to come in first because they played him a week ago. He's going in during half term. And he was like, damn. Um, and then uh, there were scouts from Manchester City and Manchester United watching him and they wanted him to go there and all the rest of it. When... Um, when he was, I, for, I forgot what I was. I oh, was... you know what? That's one of my gripes of academies is because mm -hmm. now you, you mentioned um, the academy was saying, "Oh, they're not, they've not developed in the way that we want." Yeah. And then the the feedback I get from the parents I talk to is, "Oh, the, the academy have turned around and said this." It's like it was their job. It's their responsibility. If you're signing for an academy, I think it's their responsibility to make mm -hmm. sure that they develop the player. <clears throat> And then if they get to the point where they're not happy with the development and you actually really question what they've done, mm -hmm. they haven't done their job, I think. Yeah. A lot of the time from what I get, and then especially with speed and athleticism, me and you both know to get quicker with and without the ball, you need to be doing training at maximal intent. Because there's a lot of this whole, oh, everything should be done with the ball. No, it shouldn't. You need to... Do, you need to hit a, a certain <clears throat> threshold to improve speed and agility. Mm -hmm. 
the only way to do that is without a ball. The ball slows you down. So you cannot hit that level of intent. Um, so sprint and agility training should be that. But more often than not, it's a little bit of sprint and agility work mm -hmm. peppered into football training. So then they actually haven't done proper sprint and agility training. And then they turn around and they say, this player isn't quick enough. It's like, well, what training have you done? Oh, we did a bit of sprint and agility. You didn't. Yeah, you, I mean, you've just like, filtered it into football. Like, to, to, it's 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 a hard one again because <laughs> I think academies try their best um, to to do a good job. Now, whether they <coughs> that person who's trying to do a good job has the experience to be able to do the best job, you know, or well, there's enough of them. Oh, there's enough of them. They need more stuff. Um, is 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 a is another story. I mean, I think before, as a parent, before I get to a point where I have to hear that my son is lacking certain things, I'm going to try and fix those things as best as I can. That's my responsibility as a parent. You know, it's just the same as when you go to school and your you expect the school to teach you everything you need to know to pass an exam. That's never been my experience. You know, I've always done things outside of the the institution that is where my whether it's educational or in this case an academy. Um, I've always done things outside of that because I understand that not one thing can be responsible for everything. So with so, with, with Stam's story, Samuel's yeah. story, mm -hmm. to clarify. He ha he wasn't in any academy. He was he was at Swindon. Yeah, for a couple of years because it was this the academy closest to, um, the academy closest to his school because yeah. he was at boarding school. Right, and uh, but after a couple of years, the um, everything changed at Swindon, um, and. He first of all, uh, my personal opinion, he wasn't getting the coaching that he needed, um, and he also um, there was a setup within Swindon that I didn't particularly like, um, and I wasn't my son. I wasn't comfortable with my son being in that environment, so I took him out. So the two years that he was there was mm -hmm. that fourteens and fifteens. Yeah. Yeah, 14s, 15s, and maybe it's start of 16. And so did you get him out without having to do any compensation? Yeah, yeah because they they literally said, um, I gave them the reasons why I didn't want him there. Yeah. Um, and they also, um, they agreed. And so, yeah, no, there was no compensation. And also he went to, he was at school. And I said, look, there's, he wants to do his A-levels. Um, and you guys don't do A-levels, so there's no way he's going to do a scholarship here at Swindon. Um, so we... So no academy up until Swindon, up until 14s? Yeah, 15s, 16s, early 16s. So he's training with you, mm -hmm. you're developing his mindset, you're making him, you know, this amazing athlete. Also Te working on him uh, technically. I was going to say. So Sean Daly, who oh, yeah. is an amazing yeah. coach. And Sean, I, like, I've had... I wouldn't say battles. We've had some wicked games with mm -hmm. Sean. Yeah, like mm -hmm. so back in the day, I would have had very, very good under seven, under eight groups. There was a year where my group wasn't as strong. Like mm -hmm. it was the year actually Florian Maluda's boy played in. He okay. was just like the star player. And we ended up getting quite a few kids signed that year. But anyway, I remember Sean Daly's team battered me. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he was renowned for having like good players as well. Like he's, 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 listen, he's a good Sean, coach. Sean understands football inside yeah. and out. Um, there's a reason why he's worked at Chelsea, Arsenal, Tottenham, Liverpool, and now he's at Luton. Um, I mean, the way he, personally, from, from a personal experience, the way I see him coaching children is, is unbelievable. So He's been uh, around a lot of kids that have signed at top academies. He understands huge, what it takes. Huge number of kids. Yeah, yeah, huge yeah. Number yeah. Of kids. He's just not that, he's not on social media. He's not that type of person that boasts about what he's done. But, yeah. I mean... I, so, the way so he, he was coaching Samuel, I was very, very okay. happy with, and he was also harsh but fair. Okay. And, you know, he he started to 
instill in Samuel a a mindset of, for example, if you're in an academy, you can't wear gloves on the pitch. Yeah, okay. Yeah? You can't, if you're concerned about a little bit of cold in your hands, then you don't, you don't have the right mind, mindset. And little things, from little things to to bigger things, and then treating each age group um, relevant to their their um, emotional maturity at that time. So he treats he treats twelve year old twelve year olds different to sixteen year olds, etc., etc. I, I think when you know the level that's required to get kids signed to clubs, you know the technical demands, and you find a way to deliver that. Mm -hmm. So, so. That was good. So you found you'd got a good coach. Yeah, and then I was technical development. And then I was also doing stuff with him. Yeah, uh, right. Okay. Te technically, from stuff that I'd seen at Hamburg, Bayern Munich, Chelsea, etc., etc. And so you were comfortable saying, no, he's going to focus a lot on his education. He's at a good boarding school. Mm -hmm. He's getting doing really well with his grades. Yeah. Okay. Very well. Right. Good. And so then you were comfortable enough to say, right, at a certain time, I will bring him into. So, so when did I you just, start I, to say? I just or, knew he, not not that I was going to bring him into it. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I was quite happy for him to remain at school, finish his A levels. Yeah. And then go on trial at a club. Really, that's quite a brave decision. No, it's not brave because I knew, for example, I knew that athletically and physically, and technically. Okay, let's leave the technical side out. Let's say that he's technically as good as all the other boys. I knew that athletically, uh, his, his speed would make him stand out, and so I, I wanted to to work on those things, and Fulham agreed. The reason that I say it's a brave thing to do mm -hmm. is that we do know that academy environment is a better environment to produce footballers than grassroots in the UK and statistically is proving that. Mm -hmm. Also, the younger that you sign into an academy, statistically is now giving you a better chance to become a footballer, statistically. Mm -hmm. So like, if you look at the under 21s that have just won that competition, I think they won the Euros, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Make sure I get this right. They looked at it and I think it was around 80%, upwards of 80% of those players joined their academies in the foundation age, which means like, on the nines, on the tens. So, but, but if you, but I would say that on the flip side to that, how many thousands for every one of those boys, how many thousands didn't make it that were already in academies? Do you know what I mean? I, I, the, the, what I'm saying is that it is a brave thing to do to say. I'm not going to put my child into an academy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to trust myself. I'm going to trust grassroots and focus on school and it's all going to be okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know if every parent would feel confident doing that. Yeah, and, and, and I get that. And that's where you need a good plan and you need to have uh, and follow and, and have conversations with people such as yourself and Sean Daly and myself. And that's why I've decided to do this plan to give parents a resource that I never had, a resource of this is what you should be doing technically, this is what you should be doing with nutrition and sleep and all of these things, and this is what you should be doing from a strength and conditioning point of view that's age re relevant uh, and appropriate for that for your child. You know, so it's about trusting that, and because not every there's only a certain amount of places at an academy yeah for every age group and if your child's outside of that you shouldn't panic and go oh my god they're they're not going to you should just say take it as an opportunity and say right i'm going to make sure and so is my child i'm going to have sit down and have a conversation of what we need to do in order to get there so for example from august 2022 to february Samuel was training at school by himself. Yeah, he was doing his own technical sessions, which we'd um, designed for him. He was at a football school, so they would play a lot of football. And then um, I spoke to Sean Daly and said, look, he needs to play under 18s 
he needs a team outside of school to play under 18 football. So he said, oh, let's join him to Dunstable. And Sean, um, I found out the other day that George Best played for Dunstable. So, um, and he, so he was playing football in school on Saturdays. He was playing football outside of school. Um, and he was just playing as much football as he could possibly get. But the contract that Samuel signed with himself was, I'm going to make sure that every training session, I train as if it's my last ever training session. And that's how he pushed himself. I'm getting this, sorry. Um, I'm just getting the sense that <coughs> the, it feels, I might be wrong, but it just, it feels like everything you've done mm -hmm. has been setting Sam up to just excel at whatever. Mm -hmm. And it kind of just happens to be football. Yeah. So it doesn't feel like you've ever put pressure or geared him to, you might have put a little bit of um, direction. But I mean, you know, seeing as he's, you've worked with so many boxers, it mm -hmm. feels like he maybe could have gone towards boxing <laughs> because he's, he's been around that environment. But it just sounds like everything you've been doing has just been gearing him to succeed in whatever he wants to do. And he's been drawn to football. Yeah. And now because of everything you've done and the foundation you've yeah. laid, now when it's like push comes to shove, he's he's um he's being able to fall back on all of the habits that you built in him. You're a hundred percent right. Um, and he's now got the discipline and everything yeah. to really push himself and take advantage of getting involved in football. Whereas some parents might just be pushing football a little bit too early, a little bit too much, rather than the idea of pushing the individual the to be successful. Exactly. The yeah, foundation exactly. of just excelling. Yeah, and you're 100% right. And the reason why I laugh when you say boxing is because he's actually an incredible boxer. Um, and I've stopped him <laughs> boxing because he was knocking a lot of people out. Um, and um, he's just very, very good at boxing because he's seen it. He was taught how to box by David Hay and Mehr Khan, all these type of people. He would be in the gym just copying and, you know, like you said before, learning through osmosis. He was also an excellent athlete. So, in fact, I'm pretty sure if he wanted to, he'd be one of the, one of the fastest athletes on earth. But you have to dedicate a lot of, it has to become very specific now. And I think this summer just gone, he ran 1083. No way. Oh um, my God. And he's got the engine to do 90 minutes on the pitch as and well. And he's got the engine to do <laughs> wow. 90 minutes on the pitch as well. I think his top speed that they've measured at um, Fulham is 35.5 kilometers an hour. And what's his height? He's six foot one and a half so far. He's still growing. Now, um, now do you think that some of this is down to nature? Nature, do you mean? Yeah, sorry. Nature versus nurture. Um, I think that, look, Usain Bolt was able to run the the world record because his levers allowed him to, but he also wasn't that fast. I mean, in 2007, Tyson Gay was beating Usain Bolt and Tyson Gay small, much smaller. So he had to go away and, and train and do whatever he needed to in order to beat Tyson Gay because he had that stimulus. I need to beat that guy because I'm running fast, but not as fast as he is. Um, so I always think that nurture is much more important you know the the environment that you're in the stress that you got put under as long as it's healthy stress will always you know give me an athlete who is dedicated over one who's talented any day of the week and the one who's dedicated will always come out on top um and so i don't really you know, for any parents watching this, I was reading the other day, I couldn't believe it. I saw um, that um, Harland was on trial when he was 14 or 15 at Everton and he got turned down. Yeah, because the coaches took a look at him and went, he's not good enough. Mbappe was on trial at Chelsea when he was 15 and they said he's not good enough. Did they? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and the list is endless. Same as Samuel when he was at Fulham, not good enough. 17, wow, yes, we want you. And so the, the, the lesson here for parents is don't just accept what is happening at this particular day. Just use that as, a, as motivation to try and find a way to keep going 
And just because you're good at 15 or not good at 15 doesn't mean you're going to be good or not good at 20 years old. And, and you know, I have to also give credit to Samuel's mum. Um, who? Otherwise, <laughs> you get in trouble. Uh, yeah, but she she's into uh, energy healing, and she she does a whole bunch of um, different things with Samuel that I can't necessarily offer him, and so he's well balanced from that point of view. So, and the other day I saw that there's a, a football club that now has an energy healer. And so the footballers go in and she balances their chakras and does all of that kind of stuff because football's going, all sport is going in a different direction that it's not just, oh, it's eat some protein and do a bit of training and that's it. No, it's going into visualization, meditation, uh, energy healing, um, mm -hmm. massage, mm -hmm. uh, rest, recovery, uh, supplementation, everything because it, people are starting to realize that in order to gain an edge, you need everything. You can't just rely on one thing the mm. same way going back to it, that you can't just rely on the club to make sure that your son or daughter is successful. You, you have to take it upon yourself to help them realize mm. how much more they need to do. To follow on from Matthew's point, because mm -hmm. I agree that, it absolutely seen that you'd set Samuel up and you know both your daughter as well mm -hmm. you've set them up to be successful there's a stat that I really love which mm. is 96 percent it's an estimated 96 percent of S&P 500 CEOs in America played college level sport and that's very obviously hard to do in America mm -hmm. and they think that it's so consistent with those CEOs because of the life skills they get. Now, we did an interview recently with some Scunfort players and, you know, a lot of academy kids end up playing lower league football and that is not an easy life to do that. No. Um, like, but I just feel that your, your children, if they don't, didn't pursue football, mm -hmm. even sport, Maybe even bus if they went into business, they probably would be successful. Yeah, and that's what you want as a parent. You just want your son, your your children to be successful um, and to be happy in doing what they're doing. And so, um, my my philosophy has always been: listen, I, I used to be a sports person, so uh, I'm super competitive. Yeah, and I wanted to become the best um, sports and human performance coach on the planet. And that's what I'm striving to every day. I don't, I don't rest. Um, I'm constantly researching. I'm constantly looking at ways to improve. Not, and, and I don't have an ego. So I've always gone and learned from people who've had much more experience than me. So I think I was telling you guys before, I went to learn from Angelo Dundee, who used to coach uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, Emmanuel Stewart, who's coached um, Tyson, uh, sorry, Klitschko. Um, you Freddie remind Roach. me of Tim Grosvenor. <laughs> okay. Um, for, for those that don't know him, he's mm -hmm. written the book Relentless, one of my mm -hmm. favourite books. Yeah, I love that book. Yeah. yeah, and he was like Michael Jordan's coach. Mm -hmm. But like at the very start of his conversation, when you're talking about the work you do with your athletes, you are saying, "This is I'm going to have ultimate control here. You're going to have to follow my methods. Mm -hmm. And it just sounded like that rhetoric. Yeah, I mean, look, I've coached successful athletes yeah and also non-successful athletes but the non-successful athletes has been their own doing and i have no no um i have no um no shame in saying that it wasn't my fault okay. and they know who they are right and the reason why they weren't successful is because i used to say to them all the time turning up to training is easy Turning up to the football club, turning up to the boxing gym, um, whatever it is that you're doing, that's the easy part. It's what do you do when you leave there that will allow you to become successful or not? Mm. Like Arsene Wenger the other day was talking and, um, on stage and he was saying the exact same thing. When they get to 18, 19, what, can they stay away from clubs? Can they stay away from girls? Can they stay away from the, the nightlife, the drinking, the smoking, 
all of the things that will ultimately make them fall down. And that's the most important. And that's where, as a parent, have those difficult conversations with your children and, and put discipline in there, you know, because it's, there's go, those, those, those milestones and those hurdles are going to come up and it's how you handle them and can you notice them and does your child talk to you about, look, this has come up or this. Because being in a, at an academy, for example, and now I see it with Samuel, it's super tough. Yeah, It's super tough. You're dealing with so many different personalities. You're de- dealing with different coaches. You're dealing with coaches having favorites. You're dealing with all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And luckily for Samuel, he takes everything as a challenge. So he's like, okay, hey, I'm going to win that coach over. Yeah. Or I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. And he doesn't see it as, oh, I'm going to, my head's going to come down. And because of that, whenever I have had um, meetings with the coaches, they always say, listen, he's a joy because he, ev- he takes everything on board. Wow. And he, he just wants to learn. So, um, sorry, I had some still out of time as well. Um, has Sammy always wanted to be a football player? Um, yeah, but I feel like most boys want to be football players. Yeah. I didn't take him seriously. I'm just thinking about his mindset mm-hmm. when he sees academy football going on mm-hmm. and does he start to think, I'm not in an academy or maybe, oh, I'm not at a Cat 1 academy. Um, did he still have the goal of wanting to be a pro and did he just kind of still keep working towards that? Whereas I can imagine a lot of players that aren't at academies are thinking... There's no chance for me. Well, that's, that, that's where that's where belief comes into it. Yeah. So I've tried in my own way to dissuade Samuel just to see where he's at. So I used to say to him, listen, you don't want it. Or you don't train hard enough to become a professional football player. Um, you're not going to do this. You're not going to do that. And at every stage, he'd be like, I'll show you. You'll see. And But I know my son. Yeah, so he he rises to challenges. And so, like, I've had conversations with the Fulham coaches and I've said, push him, try and break him. Like, literally, try and see if you can break him. I've had other parents and yeah. players do the same. Because, because unless you realise that football is one of the most competitive things yeah. on earth. Yeah. And listen, I'm, I'm from sports where there can only be one. There can only be one fastest woman in the world. There can only be one heavyweight champion in the world. Okay, there's now a few belts, so you get two or three. But there's not thousands of those type of athletes. Mm. So I look at it from whoever I'm working with or whatever advice I'm giving to to whoever, I'm going to try and make that person the best in the world. Yeah. And somewhere along the line, they might not quite get there, but they'll still become a professional and earn a good living. And you know what I mean? So that's that's kind of and going back to that thing with success i always say sport will help you become successful later on in life whether it is sport that you end up doing or not because of the discipline mm-hmm. because of the okay i have to work like michael phelps waking up at four in the morning to go swimming every day for five years jesus christ come on like if you think about it that's a lot to take on when you you're when it's cold, your body doesn't want to do it. You're exhausted. You can't even think, but you still turn up every single day because that's the promise that. Yeah. You, and now he's going to become successful at something else, I'm sure, mm-hmm. because of that level of dedication mm-hmm. that he's shown to his graft. So that that for me is the most important thing. But then also enjoy the journey. Enjoy. I used to go. I used. To, I'll be honest with you. I used to love watching Samuel play on a Saturday morning when it was grassroots football or on a Sunday morning. I used to love it. No, I love it just as much, but maybe... Not just I, as much. <laughs> yeah, maybe not just as much, but I used to love love it because it was it was fun and it was something to do with him and just the same way that now I love going to watch my daughter play tennis tournaments and when she says things to me like, oh, um, I'm playing two years up, I don't know if I'm going to win or not. Mm -hmm. I always say to her, don't worry. What's the most important shot in tennis? It's the next one. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you lost or won the last one. It's the next one that's the most important. So focus on that. And I couldn't care less whether you lose or or win or lose. Mm -hmm. I couldn't care less. But let's just try to improve and show me all the shots that you've been working on Mm -hmm. in, in training. Drop shots. 
backhand slices, you know, all of those kind of things. And so then you make that the focus. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along the line, that then becomes a winning mentality, as opposed to, you've got to win. Or when mm -hmm. I used to see parents shouting at their kids, um, once this, this dad was shouting at his son because he couldn't stop Samuel, because Samuel was much quicker than him. And he was just shouting at him and shouting at him. And I was thinking, that's the wrong yeah, thing. It's yeah, just the same yeah. way that I wouldn't yeah. shout at Samuel because he wasn't doing other things. Yeah. I'd be like, I'd look at it and go, okay, let's see if we can work and improve on that. We've done quite a few interviews with parents of kids in academies who are doing very, very well. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we say, it's going to be so interesting when or if these kids become real like top players mm -hmm. because like we'll have these interviews to look back at the why they why this happened it mm -hmm. doesn't happen by accident for samuel he's one of the oldest players like the parent that we've interviewed mm -hmm. so this will be quite interesting but i think regardless yeah. Whatever happens with Samuel, fingers crossed that he goes and has a great, great career. Yeah. But like, I really believe in everything that you've talked about today. Like, I can't think of anything that you've talked about that I haven't heard from other places or, you know, it's brand new information. But I think, yeah, I really buy into that. And that's something that I would advise to other parents. So, yeah. I, and I think that it will make the person a successful, happy person to deal with life in 2023 and beyond. So I, I think it's just fantastic advice. I don't know what your takeaways are, Matthew. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's probably a good place to... Uh, there's so many other questions. Yeah, we can literally <laughs> do another episode, no, another two yeah, hours. I'm happy to come back yeah, on. That, that, um, that's probably a nice place to leave it. Yeah. Otherwise, we'll just start going down rabbit holes again. And yeah, I want to, I want to um, really like look forward to the program that you're going to release. Mm -hmm. Like, let's keep in conversation about that. Yeah, yeah, sure. As soon as sure. you've got that ready, we want to like, share that with everyone. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, I will. I will, and um, I will. If if people want to like get in touch either with you guys or with myself and say, these are the kind of things we'd like to see in the program uh, oh, yeah. and that kind of thing, because then, you know, you can help more people with it. Yeah. So happy to do that, but um, it will have what people need in order to, to get started on the right path, um, which I think is super important. And, um, and to touch on just to finish what you said about whatever, ends up happening with Samuel. I know that he, I know how he sees himself. Uh, he's very demanding of himself and he, but he's also very relaxed with it. So when he's working out, he's working out hard, but I've taught him, right, when you have finished and you've given everything, you now relax, you then don't carry on thinking about the same thing. Did I do this or did you have to let it learn to let it go? and make little notes and then read them before your next session. So you know, okay, I did, got this wrong, but it's very important to, to have downtime and relax because then otherwise you burn out mentally, you know? So, um, and, and it's important to do things that are outside of sport, which you all enjoy as a family. And, or if you're like, I came from a single parent family, so my mom didn't have as much, uh, time to work and then spend with me, but she, she instilled certain things in me, which then I brought, I carried on doing them, you know, so, uh, but we'd always spend loads of downtime doing different things. Mm. You know, one of my favorite games is just is, uh, is Boggle. Um, do you know Boggle? <laughs> it's a, it's like a cube, um, and you shake it and it's got all these different, uh, dice in it, but they're, they're letters. And then you have to try and you've got three minutes to come up with as many different, three letter or more words in those three minutes. So oh, we yeah, play yeah, that yeah, a lot that. Oh, to yeah. help concentration oh, yeah. and those kind of things. And mm -hmm, then it gets competitive mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you want to beat, you don't want your children to beat you, but they want to beat you and that kind of thing. So we, we do loads of those kind of different things, which helps. So, uh, but it's important to enjoy the ride. Yeah. When you described how you, as a family you do the meditation, Yes, some people, they might be listening to some of this and think, oh, that's too extreme for me or something. But I can tell that you guys, yeah. you. I think, yeah, ultimately it's, 
maybe as a parent again we're not parents but I've, I've got a <laughs> I've got my project footballer on the way. I've got mm-hmm. a uh, I've got a nephew. Okay, he's, um, he's one. He started walking. He walked. He started walking mm-hmm. quite early. So okay. I'm excited. Congratulations. <laughs> um, but if it, it, yeah, it feels like that maybe as a parent you need to start thinking how extreme am I going to take my parenting and my mm-hmm. discipline, mm-hmm. Um, and then yeah, not not just so much for football journey or the athletic journey or whatever it is mm-hmm. but um because there's that constant balance we're always talking about like letting kids be kids or trying to prepare them to go into professional sport so it's it's a decision that you maybe have to consciously take quite early and say no we are going to start sacrificing this but things like you just mentioned mm-hmm. like good old family board games yeah, yeah that's yeah. not extreme oh, no. that, that, that's I'm, like yeah get your ipad away that, yeah. that doesn't feel like it's, it's extreme and it's yeah. not doable uno, I, I uno that's my favorite just, that's my daughter's yeah. favorite so uno. Is, some people might look at some things and go that's extreme yeah. some parents will go you know what taking a phone or hm i think that's extreme they, that's what they might think but there's definitely stuff like family board games yeah, and, no. and just a bedtime that's and all of the things extreme. all of the things that i've said today that don't require anything really you can mm. drink more water you can go to bed earlier you can take away phones uh, and find different ways to to communicate and to to spend time together like you say with board games and things like that but there's nothing here that you just think oh my god i can't do that you know um it's just about wanting to do it and then having the discipline to see it through mm. even when it's tough believe me it gets tough it's tough for everybody if you think that you're going your child is going to get into the top percentile of athletes in the most competitive sport in the world and not have to make sacrifices to do that then you are pretty crazy <laughs> we yeah we we need yeah we'll, we'll wrap up there but yeah thank you so much for every, thank your you time for having me on, guys. No, no, thank really you so much it. ruben and yeah hopefully we'll get to speak to you again Yeah, no, for sure. Love to come back.